Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the online show where we dive into the insights of municipal political leaders from across Canada. Our mission is quite simple. It is to shine a light on the dedicated individuals who day in and day out work around the council table to shape the communities that we call home. Joining us for today's episode is Town of Didsbury, Alberta, Councillor Ethan Williams. It will be easy to choose Didsbury once you see and experience what they are all about. Didsbury is an excellent place to do business, thanks in part to the customized service that they provide, as well as a supportive environment that is second to none. When you move to Didsbury, you will become part of a caring, family-oriented community that is diverse and inclusive, providing many opportunities for connection and engagement for you and your family. From the smallest village to the largest city across every region of the province, Alberta Municipalities represents the communities where over 85% of Albertans live. AB Munis provides a united voice for 265 of Alberta's 330 municipalities, including summer villages, villages, towns, cities, and specialized municipalities. As Alberta's largest municipal group, AB Munis listens to municipal leaders and advocates for solutions to their common issues. Additionally, AB Munis supports local governments by providing services specially designed to meet their operational needs and they bring their members together regularly so they can share ideas and information so that their communities can thrive. Check out Alberta Municipalities at abmunis.ca and follow them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, now called X. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it for taking time out of your busy day to sit down with me and talk about yourself and talk about the great town of Didsbury, Alberta. I want to start at the beginning, though. I want to talk about you, and I want to get the first question I've asked every single person who's ever come on this show, the same one, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Ethan? Well, Chris, I want to say thank you for having me. Uh, I've listen to your podcast many a time. So it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, so great first question. I actually remember when I first got into politics, um, I was, it was the 2015 election. I was sitting down on my couch, at my mom's house, a young high school student at the time. Um, and I was, I was like, wow, I I'm kind of intrigued in, in what's going on. I kind of like this. And from that, I just, I got more interested in politics and more interested in serving my community from that day forward. And then uh, in 2021, um, I would talk with my family, my friends, and I was like, you know, I, I want to, I want to run. And the main reason why I ran was Didsbury is a great place. And I, I say it's the greatest place to live, work and raise a family. But when I walked around town, I noticed a lot of the families were like 40 and younger, right? Or 30 and younger. We have three schools. And no offense to the previous council, I great friends with a lot of them. They're still on. I the youngest was 50. And I said, we we're missing a younger, we're missing a generation here. So I felt like the generation was untapped and I asked around if I should run and people encouraged me. So I put my name forward and I thought I could be the representative for the millennial or the Gen Z's. The next generation, as we call it. Um, Yes, the next generation. Prior to 2015, though, you say that's when your sort of political sort of spark hit. Yeah. Did you ever consider yourself wanting to be a politician? Did you ever think one day I'll run for municipal, federal, provincial politics? Or were you so far out of the game that it wasn't until that election that it really sparked your interest? Before 2015, I wanted to do something sports. Okay. Right? I know. I, I, is it, uh, isn't, isn't politics a sports arena anyway? <laughs> It, it it is, and I I always say um, in politics, it's in sports actually have a lot in common. 
um, you cannot get anything done without your colleagues. You're only one vote at the table at the end of the day, right? So you, you need your colleagues next to you to support you and keep you going. Uh, and just like in sports, you need your teammates to help you out. I want to talk about your time on council because you're right. You're a relatively young person getting involved oh. in the a, a realm that is traditionally dominated by, and I hate to paint a broad stroke here, but I'm going to have to a little bit for this question. Traditionally yeah. dominated by more retirees, more people with gray hair like myself who have had a few years uh, underneath their belt and they have time yeah. to spare. Uh, a, the life of a municipal councillor is not a part-time job like it was 20, 30 years ago. It's a full-time job because you go out to your community, you are stopped in the community. How do you balance, and I say you as a young person who has a full-time job, mm -hmm. balance life with the responsibility of an elected official? Um, well, first of all, you actually need a, big, you need a great support system behind you. Uh, that's number one. And luckily, I have, a, I have a great family that's with me, my mother, my sister, my brothers, and uncle, aunts, grandparents. They've, they've helped me a lot to keep me grounded. Then also with my full-time job as well, I, I'm very beneficial uh, of with my full-time position because my boss was a town councillor at one point. So he understands. He, he understands the what it is and the role behind it. And I, so you got to find time. You got to set yourself time. I, I would say actually like at least once, one day a week, set yourself, set time aside just for yourself and just reflect and regroup. Uh, that's the biggest thing. And I, I try to keep nine to five full-time job, then council, like five until 10 at night or even weekends or even this morning actually i had a 8 30 a.m call so i had to ask my boss i'm okay i'm gonna be like half an hour late into the office by the way uh, yep. but also my boss is uh very very nice uh there's been a couple times where i've had to take phone calls from the office and he's very very appreciative of that well that's awesome I want to go back to the 2021 election for a second because mm -hmm. it is uh, a daunting experience for anyone of any age, any orientation, any gender who puts their name on the ballot and decides to run. You, you talked at the beginning that you were relatively young getting into it and the traditionally the youngest person was about in their 50s in the past council. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's Ooh. the way that yeah. it worked. When you were door knocking and you were going out and asking people for the vote, yet again, it was COVID-19, so there's probably a little bit of restrictions around it. Were people saying, I can't vote for you because your age? Or were people in Didsbury more receptive and saying, sure, I'm open to hearing a young person's perspective on what they want to see the community move forward way, with? Uh, at the doors, I found a lot of people were very receptive of me being young. They they were welcome to the young i the young ideas and the new generation because uh, I I framed it as we my generation are the future leaders of the world, right? And why can't we have a voice at the table now? Uh, so talking with a lot of people that that resonated with them, and they they're very receptive to new and fresh ideas of a young person. And a lot of them like, agreed to like, yeah, we have three schools here. Like we have a lot, we have a very young population for a town of 5,000. So I'm very, I'm very beneficial. I'm very appreciative of the people of Didsbury that trust me in this very important role. So we are now three years into your first term in office. You have one year left until you either yeah. stand. And we'll talk about that next election in a few minutes here. But I want to uh, ask, looking back on the last three years, you've had to make some pretty tough choices. And I say that knowing that every municipality has to make tough choices, whether it be through budget, whether it be through uh, the 
pandemic that we just went through. How do you, as a counselor, make those tough decisions, knowing that not 100% of the people are going to be in favor of every decision you make? Because I guarantee you, you've come to the realization that even if you say the sky is blue, there's probably someone who will say, no, it's not blue, it's aquamarine. So how do you make <laughs> the best decisions knowing that everyone is not going to be 100% on board with the decisions you make? Yeah, I... I could just go back to a lesson that my grandfather taught me. He's like, no matter what you do, you're not going to be everybody's best friend. You're not going to be everybody's friend. You have to make the best decision that you think it is. And so is I try hard? to take that mindset. It, it is, it is hard. It is hard. You try, you try to make the best decision for the, the majority of, of the people there, there will always be like a small minority that, do not like it, or even the majority might not like it, but at times you have to make the tough decisions and it is difficult. It, it, but when you do make those tough decisions, because yeah. we, we often find ourselves in those so, so social echo chambers that we often find ourselves on social media. I'll, I'll hang out with people who agree with me. I'll talk to people who agree with me, but as counselor, yeah. you know, you have to represent people who disagree with yeah. you as well. So when you make those tough choices, is it important for you to communicate why you made that tough choice, but also talk to the people who disagree with you and hear their side of the story? Oh, hundred percent. And um, you try to communicate as best as you can on the decisions that you make, right? Um, we all know it, it's tough to communicate with uh, today's world. And sometimes the message doesn't get across as the way that you're attended. Um, but you just try, you have to make the decisions that you think are the best. And some, and other times you actually have to take out your own personal feelings and put the town before yourself. And I mean, that's the first thing you should do. So when you do engage, do you find people yeah. want to engage with you? Because I often say on this show, and I hate to repeat myself, but it's an important thing that we have to get people involved. Municipal politics is where the apathy lies within our political system. Federal, mm -hmm. provincial, it's quote unquote sexy because it's parties, it's people yelling at each other across the aisle. But municipally is where the rubber hits the ground and work actually gets done. And that's just my own personal opinion. That's why I talk to municipal leaders instead of provincial yeah. and federal politicians. Yeah. Well, with I feel like with that, uh, you being a municipal leader, it's it's great. Um, you listen to people about concerns about healthcare, education, immigration, housing, like every type of issue. Uh, they come to you because the municipalities are the first first stop for a lot of people to talk to, right? So you will hear a wide range of concerns. You you probably know uh, talking to. Tons of municipal, uh, municipal councillors and mayors across Canada. There, they probably have tons of great stories about them talking with their neighbor or with a citizen about one day about uh, nurse nurse shortages in BC or like garbage pickup in Prince Edward Island, right? So how do you deal with that then? Because you know, after being there for three years, and I did a little bit of research, you, you're politically involved as well, um, that the municipality has a role to play. Sewers, infrastructure, water, garbage. It's not healthcare. It's not education. As much no. as they impact your community, and I, I hate to say it this way, you don't really have a jurisdictional role to play in addressing education issues or healthcare issues. So when people do talk to you about those important federal or provincial issues, how do you respond to them without saying, it's not my purview to fix that if you want to contact yeah. your MLA or your MP, or will you take that information and contact them yourself? Because that's why they've approached you because they're probably more yeah. likely to know who you are than their MP or their MLA. Um, so yeah, that's very important. Uh, so the first thing that I do, I listen, I, I'll, regardless of, even if I, if it's a provincial or federal issue, I'll, or municipal issue, I'll listen. I want to hear the full story. Give me all the details. Let me know. And cause I I'm there to help at the best of my ability. That's my first role as a counselor, um, is talking and listening to the people. Then afterwards, if hearing, I'm like, 
I feel like your uh, issue is more healthcare related and it's more provincial related. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any jurisdiction over that, but let me get you in contact with the person, okay? This is who you should talk to regarding that, regarding your issue. If you don't feel comfortable, I will pass along your information and I'll, t and I'll ask them to contact you directly, right? Yeah, and I think the biggest thing is just like listening to the people and understanding the issue that they have and then trying to help them to the best of your ability. How often do you find that it is just people wanting to be heard? Because in today's society, we yell, no. at, we, we sort of scream at the top of our lungs on social media no. and people just want to be heard in a one-on-one -on -one sit situation no. and they don't want to just be throwing things into the void. How often do you find that people just want to be heard and listened to? Uh, I I would say like 10 out of 10 times, but I would say like a lot of, a lot of the times I, I think, I think people, they sometimes they just want to vent about one particular issue. Right. And they just want to get off the chest and they want somebody that will just be there open ears. And that's what I try to be. And at the end of it, I will, we'll see if we, where we could help with them. Right. So I want to turn to the second segment now. And before I do that, yeah. as you, anyone who's ever heard this uh, pitch, please fast forward 15 seconds. But if you haven't, please stay with me. This is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not even a policy of counsel. This is the counselor's opinion and his opinion alone. Now it may line up with what counsel's talking about at the council table, but at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is the counselor's opinion. For those who are about to send me nasty emails saying, oh, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> Please do. I'll put them in the proper filing folder, which is the recycling bin on my computer. That being said, joking aside, I do actually read all the emails that I yeah. get. And thank you for the comments, everyone. Um, counselor, in your opinion, as of recording this in the middle of September 2024, what yeah. do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the town of Didsbury today? Uh, Chris, I'm going to sound like a broken, broken record here. Uh, infrastructure. How so? You, you probably, you probably heard that a lot of the times. Uh, municipalities across Canada, we we have failing infrastructure, right? Uh, well, our biggest one here in town is our reservoir, and uh, we actually just got a provincial grant on uh, not that long ago, and we're out in the design phase of trying to get an East Reservoir built and what should be huge for the community. So that's what one area um, that I'm very proud of working with, uh, being a part of, that will be one area I will always remember for the rest of my life is help by like, getting that uh, project built. The rest of the council, we put that, they put that as their, uh, not a top, not the biggest pro uh, top priority, but one of the top priorities was that. and. So when I say infrastructure, I'm talking water, I'm talking roads, sidewalks. And as you know, we have a infrastructure deficit across the country. So this episode, this interview is being aired and uh, on the first day of Alberta yeah. Municipalities Convention in Red Deer, Alberta. So literally just up the road from you. Um, where yeah. I'm assuming this conversation is going to be on top of mind for a lot of municipalities, but if you're there, I'm assuming you may be there, uh, you will probably be meeting with ministers as well. How important is it to have these uh, in-depth conversations or even hard question, hard uh, conversations with the minister and saying we need more infrastructure funding for projects mm -hmm. like a reservoir for our roads with the ministers or even the premier of Alberta? I think that goes back to a very important thing in politics is relationship building. Is having great relationships with your community, with other communities and stakeholders and the provincial government and federal government, right? Um, you have that uh, relationship where you have an open communication, friendly relation, uh, relationship where they're not you're not afraid to give them a call at like 8 a.m. or something like that, right? So it's very important, I think, for all municipalities and for everybody 
to have a great relationship with your local MLA, with the with the local minister, uh, ministers, and the premier and their staff as well. Who is your MLA? Is it Devin Dreeshan? No, uh, we have uh, Nathan Cooper, You're, the Speaker of the House. Did, you did, that's right, Disbury Three Hills. Old. Yeah. Ah, I should have known uh, that. Disbury Three Hills. Yeah, should have known that. Ah. Yeah. Who's the speaker? I, I mean, we're, we're we're in a good we're in a good spot. I would say, uh, Didsborough. We got some great players. Uh, people like you just mentioned, Dreeshan up north. You, Devin Dreeshan, Mitchell Transportation. Then, right to the side of us, just west of us, is Jason Nixon, Minister of Community Social Services and Seniors. Then to the east of us, you have Minister of Finance Nate Horner. Then our MLA is the Speaker of the House. The trifecta, the three biggest things. That yeah, are going right. the some of the biggest portfolios. Yeah. Um, you, you talk about that reservoir project. Now, yeah. that is an important project for any municipality. Water is a key source for a lot of municipalities. And I, I hate to make light of it, but it's not the quote unquote. And I, I say this because the, the mayor of Penhold, Alberta, said this during the last provincial election. Yeah. It's not the sexy thing that sells and it's not no. the sexy thing that many residents of your community is like, oh, we got a new reservoir. Yeah. How do you get people on board of investing into those type of projects in a community like Didsbury? Because roads are things that people can see on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, yeah. The water coming out of their faucet is something they see on a day-to-day -day basis, but they don't go by a reservoir and go, oh, I'm so happy we invested yeah, in that. Yeah. How do you get people to in find that type of thing uh, invigorating? Yeah. Well, uh, you, you, you did a great job right, right there. Roads and sidewalks are the big picture items that everybody sees. And they see, oh, great, awesome, I love it. My pothole's fixed. My curve of my sidewalk is fixed. People don't see the reservoir, but it is one of the most important things that we deal with is water. Because without water, you don't have a lot of things in life, right? You're telling um, you that if you, you don't turn the water on, like we are here in Calgary, turn your water yeah. on and we have to we only can run it for 30 seconds. You, you really start to realize yes. those reservoirs are quite important to those worlds. Yeah, they're quite important. Yeah. Uh, so then we just go back to what we talked about earlier and that's communication, communicating how important that project is to the residents. And uh, I just want to give a shout out to our mayor, Mayor Hunter and the rest of the administration. They have done a great job. I think a rest of council like talking and communicating about how important a reservoir project is. And, and I don't want to like say anything bad about the Calgary situation, but I think the Calgary situation has helped a little bit too, because people are seeing that and how, how big of an impact water truly is on all of us. Right. So using that and showing them like, we we're, we're planning for the future we we want to be we don't we want to upgrade our infrastructure here uh because we don't know what could happen we don't know if our pipes could burst right and we're just trying to be on top of it and showing them like that's like very extreme measures and trying to keep on top of our infrastructure and people are, are appreciative of that they're appreciative of, like be on top of things right be on top of the infrastructure that's why they pay taxes they want to have roads they want to have sidewalks but they also want to have their infrastructure not failing on them right they want they want to have the ability to turn on the tap and have fresh water so that is a very big macro issue you talk about there which yeah. is infrastructure which is reservoirs water but now I'm going to just put this on the table. I've been to Disbury and I've chatted with some of your residents because that's what I do. I'm that creepy guy who goes to communities and like, <laughs> community because that's what I do. And I yeah. can tell you that was not on the top of the, most of the people that I talked to. And I talked to about 15, 20 people and their issues yeah. were healthcare. 
roads and i mean roads like potholes which i guess is infrastructure yeah. a little bit then i heard crime i heard safety i heard and i'm not saying mm-hmm. that they felt safe it's just they wanted more police officers they had some very micro issues one person I, if, I, if i'm remembering correctly they wanted a better upgraded sidewalk in front of their house because they just didn't have one so they wanted to talk about that because that was their issue mm-hmm. And those are important issues to everyday people. Now, you're about to head into budget season, which is a very tough time for a lot of municipalities, particularly with everything going on with the infrastructure challenges. How do you see yourself being able to balance the needs of the few? And I'm going to quote Star Trek here a little bit. Mm -hmm. The needs of the few with the needs of the many, because you can't look at every issue as a micro issue like that's only going to help john or sarah you have to look at everything as a didsbury issue how do you see yourself being able to balance the needs of the many with the needs of the few so i right off the bat i when it comes to the budget i encourage everybody we have a budget survey i encourage everybody to do it because i want to hear from everybody about what is the biggest issues that are impacting you that are under the municipality control, right? And that that shapes how I vote. And it's tough. I uh, we we go down the uh, needs and wants list, right? Uh, a want of mine is every road paved with gold or silver, right? Being top of the line, but we have to come back to reality. And do we have the budget to do it? And it's tough and talking with the people we, we I try to explain to them like we, we try to get as much roads as we possibly can done but we also have other issues that we have to talk about like sidewalks uh emergency vehicles right so fire police then arts and culture as well and recreation you have all these issues so you have to it's a kind of like a juggling act and trying to get the the needs from the citizens what they want that's do you think the top the town, priorities. do you think the town council has done a good job with that juggling act because every municipality is juggling right now it's just yeah. who does it and i shouldn't say who does it better but who makes sure that they can balance that do you feel like the town of didsbury's council has been able to juggle the, the yeah. macro issues with those micro issues that people may have? I, I Well, I can't speak for a, count, a town council here, but I, I will say that I'm very proud of the work that we have done, and we have some great people at council tables. Awesome. So we all have issues, understandably. Yeah. It's the name of the game that municipalities, you, you, you mentioned it in your answer. It's not a shocker that infrastructure is the top priority and a yeah. top challenge for a lot of municipalities. But there's things that each municipality does right. There's things that municipalities get good. When you mm-hmm. talk to other municipal leaders or even talk to your own citizens, what do you say to them when they ask, what's the town of Didsbury doing right? Doing right. Uh, that's a great one. I want to high, highlight a project that we just did. And I think we we did it right. I think we hit it on the, on the head. Uh, we were looking at replacing our art banners downtown, right? And so what we did um, from the beautiful uh, idea of our administration, we put it out to the public. And we asked them, send in your pictures, pictures of your backyard, sending your paintings. Like what, when you think of Ditchbury, what what makes you think of Ditchbury? Put that in art form, right, for us. So we had tons of submissions, and the committee of the whole we had a committee of the whole meeting, and we sat down. We as council, we picked the best ones. And so I don't know if you actually have driven past Didsbury in the last like month or so. So we put them up not that long ago, right after grad season, because we have grad banners that a community group does. So right after the community, right after the grad season, we put up our brand new art banners. And they're everything. Like there's uh, some a picture of some kids playing hockey to a moose to our town mascot of Didsby. And I think that's one project that we got right. And 
uh, we actually had CTV come down and interview us. And we had other towns reach out and we're like, wow, this is like phenomenal. Like that's a cool idea. So, so I those, think that's one For issue. those who are following me on social media, I'm going to be in Didsbury the day this airs. So by the time this is airing, I will have driven yeah. through Didsbury at least once and I will take photos and head over to our Facebook page and Please be sure do. to check those photos yes. because I want to see what these look like because I've not been there in the last month and I want to see what these look like because I think it sounds yeah, like a cool I, idea. I, I want to uh, step outside tonight. I will take some pictures, Chris, and I'll email them to you. Uh, to make the room better, yeah, I it's it's great. It's a, it was a community initiative uh, done by administration, and it just showcased all the great artists that we have in our town, and it showcased the beauty of it. That's awesome. So check those out on our Facebook page. They'll be up there. They may have to go back, but we will try and have them out at the same time that this airs. Um, so. I want to uh, ask a new question that I've introduced into this round of uh, Alberta counselors uh, questions that I've been asking. And we talked about it briefly at the top of the interview, and that is you're three years into a four-year term. That means yeah. in 2025, in October, you will be heading to an election in the town of Didsbury, like every other municipality in this province. Will we see Councillor Ethan Williams' name on the ballot once again, or have you made up your mind yet? That's still something I'm actually thinking about and I'm still discussing uh, with my family and friends. I, I'm i young, right? Uh, so uh, I've thought about even going back to school. I'd like to get my master's and get that finished. I would like to travel a little bit more. So it's still a juggling act. Uh, being a town councillor has been the biggest honour of my life. And will I run again? I... So hope I will run again, but it's not up to me. It's up to the people. It's up to the citizens of Didsbury if if they want to see my name on the ballot again. So you heard it here first. If you want him to run again, go ask. Go tell talk to Councillor Williams <laughs> and make sure he runs. Um, I want to turn to my last subject, and it's an important one. We talked about it a little bit, but I want to go into a little bit more depth, and that is tourism. I think tourism is an untapped resource and I know Didsbury has some great tourism draws because you are the one community that everyone talks about whenever you talk about anything to do with TV because everyone's like, you need to go to Didsbury. <laughs> if you're a fan of any TV show in Alberta, it's Didsbury, Didsbury, Didsbury. So while we can talk about the aspects of the tourism of the film and television industry in Didsbury, I want to point a poignant question. What are some of the tourist spots that you recommend in the town of Didsbury if someone's coming through? Oh, I think this is the best question. I get to highlight the the best spots in. So should Didsbury. I go away oh, for like ten minutes and come right, back? Right, I know. <laughs> How long do we have? Um, so you, you did say that you have driven past, driven through Didsbury. You have stopped, so you probably stopped at some of our coffee shops. We have some great coffee shops. Uh, 1905 Bistro, amazing. Um, if you've not tried that, you got to try it. Vintage Coffee is another one, amazing. Uh, the uh, County Nook is great for breakfast, uh, but for tourist spots, I love the museum. I, I'm a history nerd when it comes to it, and one of my actually first jobs, this is crazy, was I was a summer student at the Disbury Museum years ago and in my free time i i sit I, i'm on the board of directors as a volunteer not as a counselor just as a volunteer and when i try when i have the opportunity i do volunteer with them uh, so i would shout out them the Ditchbury library is another one fantastic library the golf course is another and i i think the best part is though it's just the heritage buildings. When you drive downtown, it's like you driving through a 1970s movie, a 1980s movie. It's just a beautiful red brick buildings, right? I guess we should mention that one of the main, one of Canada's most favorite uh, Western female lead shows was filmed in Didsbury. That's what my joke was at the beginning, and that is Winona Earp. If I'm not mistaken, is that if the, I think it's Winona yeah. Earp? If correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, correct. Recommend. So if you look, watch that show, 
You go to Didsbury, you're basically on the set because it's almost filmed in the entire community. Yeah. Well, we also had Let Him Go with Kevin Costner. I, well, favorite film of mine, I, I'm a big Kevin Costner fan. Uh, so came down, shot his movie Let Him Go at JD's Restaurants. Another great place for wings, by the way, is JD's. Um, so uh, when so yeah, now next, I, got I have to go get some wings. So just put yes, that yes, up. next time you're in town, to, Chris. Yes. We, yeah um so yeah jd's they, they they shot there under the banner of heaven too with andrew garfield amazing amazing show shot at some houses and they used their old uh fire station as the police station in that that's right oh my yeah. god okay <laughs> because i yeah. thought it was all filmed in car stairs but it's no, um, no. is it cars cross fields cross fields or cars stairs? Cross, yeah <laughs> Yeah, so was, uh, the the main set of the police station was is the Didsbury Fire Hall, the old Didsbury Fire Hall. Yeah, learn something new every day doing these yeah. interviews. God bless it. God bless this country. <laughs> um, but is there a spot in town that you go to? Is there a community building or is there a park that you go to and just let yourself decompress? Because after a long day of nine to five yeah. full-time job, five to 10 uh, council job, council meeting, budget meetings, interacting with residents, I'm assuming yeah. it gets uh, daunting and you just need to decompress. Where is that spot in the community that now everyone who listens to will go there if they want to go? <laughs> Where is that spot uh, for you? Yeah, so actually... Like I said earlier, uh, I have a sports background, and that's what I wanted to do when I was uh, older. So actually, it, it's the gym. I, I'm a guy that likes to just work out by himself and talk to others in the gym. So that is my place to decompress is actually the gym, going for like an hour or two, just lifting weights and talk with other gym goers. It, that is a way that I can decompress. So funny enough, it's actually next uh, to All Jacked Up, another great place for wings and pizza. <laughs> I feel like we're just going to be doing a pub crawl the entire I, time. It does. Yeah, Chris, I'm actually getting hungry now. <laughs> Me too. I want wings. I may just come up to Disbury after this. Um, yeah, you should. <laughs> So my final question for you, because I'm cautious of time and I know you're a busy man. So I have one last question and it's the million dollar question because I think it's a question that everyone knows how to answer, but let's put it on the record. In your opinion, counselor, what makes the town of Didsbury such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? I use my uh, quote that I like to use all the time. Um, it's the people. It's the citizens that make the town the best place to live. I, at the doors, and I like to tell people this when I try to explain Didsbury. Didsbury is a place where you can go to the grocery store, you can see somebody you have not seen in 15 years, or you can meet your new best friend. I like that. I like that. I want to meet, I feel like we're good best friends right now. Either yeah, we're, we go. we're good best friends. Friend. Friend. We yeah. will go do wings. I'm not going to wear a white we're shirt. We're going to do wings. Yeah. <laughs> and if I wear a white shirt, I guarantee you that it will not be white by the time I'm done with it. Yeah, but, right? Yeah. But um, it, 100%, 100%, it's it's the people. Uh, the people are amazing. You can strike up a conversation with it, with anybody. There is some fabulous people in, in town of Detroit. That's awesome. Counselor Ethan, if you don't mind me calling you that, like you said, yes. I, I said you didn't. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and taking about 45 minutes out of your schedule and sitting down and doing this interview. It was an honest of goodness pleasure. And I'm so looking forward to getting up there and visiting you and going out for wings, going to visit some of these great spots that you talked about. And as a fan of Kevin Costner as well, you need to show me where he sat so I can sit there. And so I can say I sat where Kevin Costner sat or where Kevin Costner walked because yeah. I'm a massive fan. So thank you so much for <laughs> taking time for doing this. Well, thank you for having me. And yeah, for sure. Uh, next time you're in town, if we can get together, it'd be great. Thank you for tuning in for another great episode of Cross Border Interviews. Now, we hope you've enjoyed today's conversation with one of Canada's municipal leaders truly making a difference within their own community. If you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button 
here if you're listening to it on any audio stream or on YouTube. We have some great live shows coming up and you will not want to miss them. Also, your support has been wonderful. So we want to take a moment and thank everyone who has gone over to the Cross Border Interviews website and hit the support the show page now. Um, it has been wonderful and we can't wait to bring you some more great shows like you've seen today. So until next time, stay connected, stay informed, and we'll see you here on Cross Border Interviews.